All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started here. Again, we've got a lot to cover. My name is Captain Mike. I'm the editor of the Florida Sport Fishing Magazine, host of Florida Sport Fishing TV, and I love to fish. I love to catch fish. I like to, you know, catch all sorts of fish. I like all of the different venues, everything from bonefish to blue marlin and everything in between. So tonight, we're going to talk about planers and downriggers, okay? And really, probably the, the best name for this seminar is controlled depth fishing. Why do we want to have our baits deeper in the water column? Let's talk about that. Here, especially South Florida, summertime, that water temperature climbs, right? Gets really, really hot. Well, what happens when that water temperature climbs, all of the bait fish seek refuge and shelter deeper in the water column, where it's darker and cooler. And guess who's down there with all of the bait? King mackerel and wahoo and blackfin tuna and sailfish and pretty much every other pelagic game fish that you could catch out here are down there deeper in the water column. It's not as important throughout the winter time when that water temperature is a little bit cooler, but during the summer time when it's really warm approaching the high 80s, you know, those fish are going to seek shelter deeper in the water column and that's going to become more and more prevalent as the day progresses at eight o'clock in the morning, seven, eight o'clock in the morning, you know what, those fish may still be up toward the surface, okay, where that water was cooled throughout the night. Come nine, 10, 11, when that sun is blazing and certainly by noon, one o'clock, you're not gonna find those fish way up on top. They're gonna be deeper in the water column. So we have to find a way to present our baits to those fish deeper in the water column. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. One of them, of course, is your traditional, very simple egg sinker type of rig. You use an egg sinker in front of a bait, you drop that down deeper in the water column, and certainly that can work. But on the troll, when you're trolling, there's really only a couple of different methods. And one of those is with a planer, and one of them is with a downrigger. There's a lot of nuances, a lot of differences between the two of them. And really, just like every other aspect of fishing, it's all in the details. We're going to start with planers, and I'll tell you why. The local charter boat industry down here, okay, down, especially out of Hillsborough Inlet, there's a lot of charter boats right there by the inlet. Everybody sees them, the rebound and all those other guys. Those guys are masters at fishing planers. They fish planers year round. And let me tell you something, they catch some fish, okay? They catch some serious fish. Do not think that those charter boats go out there for four hours and come home empty handed. I've seen some of those guys come back and throw five to eight wahoo on the dock, okay, along with tunas and king mackerel and all kinds of stuff. They catch a lot of fish, and they have to because they're out there taking customers, paying passengers, you know, on lots of these trips, so they have to produce. So they put together an approach that really is kind of a meat fishing approach. It's not targeting one particular species of fish, it's targeting everything. On one bait, you may catch a bonita. The next bait may be a dolphin. The next bait may be a wahoo, maybe a king mackerel, maybe a sailfish. They're really targeting everything that's out there with a universal spread. And I've learned a lot, I don't wanna say from them, but, well, I should say from them because sometimes, you know, you, you shouldn't reinvent the wheel. Planers, you know, they come in a lot of different sizes. And before we talk about how we fish them, Let's make sure that you clearly understand what a planer is and what the purpose of a planer is. Very simple contraption, okay? In the fishing position, that's what we call it, in the fishing position, swims through the water like this, okay? The weight holds it down and it just takes your bait, dives it deeper into the water column. Very kind of simple process. Your leader comes off the back of the plate right here has a long leader right to your bait. A fish strikes and the planer trips, and you now reel in that fish with the planer in line. You cannot reel in the fish with the planer in the fishing position because it creates way too much drag, way too much stress with this large plate catching water. That's why that planer, again, this is in the fishing position, it trips, and now you reel it in in line. These have been around for a very, very long time. Okay, why? Because it's one of those tools that just works. It's been around for a very long time and it has changed very, very little in the last 30 years. You pick up a planer from 1985 or a planer from 2015, they're gonna look identical. 
but there is something that's very important about planers that you have to understand, and that is the number rating. So as an example, this is a number eight planer. This is a number six planer. But if you look at them, they're identical. The plate size is identical. A lot of people make the mistake and they think that a planer is rated by the plate size, and that is not correct. A planer is rated by the weight size, the size of the lead. So this is an eight ounce sinker, and this is a six ounce sinker. That's how a planer is rated. So you must keep that in mind that the lead, the weight, plays a huge factor in how deep that planer will swim. Of course, an eight ounce planer will swim deeper than a six ounce planer, even if the plates are the same size. From there, there are smaller planers, and one of the most universal sizes around here that we use a lot are number threes and number fours. Okay, this is a typical number three size planer, three ounce lead, average size plate. This is probably the most common planer that you'll see in use down here, okay, is a number three. But keep in mind, sometimes we'll go with small, we'll use really small planers when we're trying to catch bait. Little bonitas and bullet blackfin tuna that we try and catch for bait that we use for shark fishing, wahoo fishing, and other arenas, sword fishing. To catch these smaller bullets, we use these little planers. Okay, really, really effective. And they're not only used here. All over the world, I've fished, you know, Costa Rica, Panama, Guatemala. These guys catch all of their bait, all of their bonitas with planers. Okay, they all do. It's universal, works everywhere. So it's important to know that there are different planers and different sizes. Okay, and obviously you have to determine when am I going to use what size planer. Keep in mind, you, if you're going to fish two planers, and we always do, okay, and we're going to talk about that with downriggers too, we always fish two downriggers, but we always fish two planers, always, but they are never the same size planer. Why? Because if we put two number three planers behind the boat at the same depth, what's going to happen? Where they're going to cross, they're going to tangle every time we make a turn, because as you can imagine, those two planers are parallel. The leaders are parallel, the planers are parallel, we run long leaders off the back of the planers, so you risk tangling. You do not, do not want to tangle two planers. <laughs> Has this ever happened to anybody? Okay, and whoever it's happened to knows that's probably a day-ending problem right there. It sucks, it really does, okay? So you don't want to tangle your planers. So we always fish two different size planers. We'll fish a smaller one, for example, a number three or a number four, and then a larger one, may it be a number six or a number eight, okay? When we are putting our planers and our baits out behind the boat, we always put the furthest, longest one is the lighter planer. This is very important. So for example, a number three may be set 200 feet back, way behind the boat, is a number three. And then the closer one, the number six or the number eight, is set 100 feet back off the other corner of the boat, obviously, closer to the boat. So your lighter planer is always going to be set further back. What happens then is instead of having the type of presentation where both of your lines are parallel, you're now like this. And now you can turn, you can practically do figure eights, okay, because your lines are never going to cross. But it has to be spaced properly. Really, really important, okay? Planers are also called poor man's downriggers, okay, because A, they're very, very affordable in comparison to a downrigger. They're very easy to fish, and there's a lot of different ways to fish them, and, and essentially they do the same thing. They take your bait deeper down into the water column very much like a downrigger does, okay? However, there are some pros and cons. One of the pros, again, to using a planer is the affordability. Much, much cheaper than a downrigger. Very effective, works really well. One of the cons is that when you attach your leader to the back plate of this planer and you're in the fishing position and you get a strike and that planer trips, you are now fighting that fish with this planer right in line. Well, what happens when this planer reaches the rod tip? Okay, you're done. You cannot reel anymore. Okay, so obviously, like a lot of the guys said here, you are now handlining the fish. You now have a long leader. You grab the leader and hand over hand, you handline them. 
there are some alternatives, and we're going to talk about those really quickly. There are some alternatives. One of the alternatives is to rig a large planer, like a number eight, on not a rod, but on a heavy piece of monofilament, 200 pound test, to tie it off to a cleat, okay? And you literally just take that planer, it is not being fished on a rod, and you deploy it off the back of the boat on a cleat. So the planer is going straight down into the water, and just as a rule of thumb, for every two feet of line you put out, that planer will swim one foot below the surface. So if you put out 80 feet of line, essentially that planer should be 40 feet below the surface. But the truth of the matter is there's so many variables. Speed, okay, how fast you're going. The line that's attached to the planer is going to affect how deep it swims. So while that's the rule, I wouldn't live and die by it, so to speak. All you know is that when you put a planer behind a boat, it's below the surface, right? It's down deep. That's all you know. If that planer's 20 feet below the surface or 31 feet below the surface, you don't know that. You, you, don't, you can guess, but you don't know that. But what I do know for sure is that my bait is below the surface. And if I want my bait deeper, obviously I'm gonna let out more line and that planer is gonna swim deeper. I don't know how deep ultimately it eventually go. My goal is that when I'm fishing these planers, that my shallow planer, the number three, is somewhere around 15 to 20 feet below the surface and my larger number six or number eight is somewhere around 30 to 35 feet below the surface. That's what I'm hoping for and what I believe is happening. If the day progresses and I tend to get bites on one or the other, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna modify my approach. If I'm getting more baits on the shallower planer, then maybe I won't put this as deep or I won't put that as deep or vice versa. You obviously have to be ready to adapt. But let's get back to this for a second. So as I mentioned, you can take this planer and you can run it right off a cleat. You can then take your rod and you can put a rubber band right on your, literally on your rod with a swivel and you can run it down the line to the planer. So in other words, your line is now going down the planer line and it will stop at the planer. And it has a breakaway rubber band. You hook a fish, the rubber band breaks, you're now fighting that fish directly. Okay, everybody kind of follow me there? Once you get your fish up in the boat, you don't have to pull your planer back up unless you are gonna risk getting tangled, then obviously pull that planer up. But if you're not risking a tangle, you can let that planer continue to swim, right, the entire time. You can fight your fish, and with the use of a rubber band and a small snap swivel, you can reapply this to the line and the water pressure will bring that snap swivel right down the line and it will stop it at the planer. It's a cool tactic, however, I gotta be honest, when I'm fishing planers, I like the hand lining approach. Okay, I really do. It's part of planer fishing, I believe. You know, that whole hand lining that fish when that planer gets to the rod, it's kind of fun. You know, I'm not something that I want to do every day. It's not the sportiest thing in the world to handline a fish, but you ever handline a 40 pound king mackerel? It's pretty cool, okay? So that's planer fishing, and I like fishing my planers right off my rods. That's what I prefer. I like to fish them in line. However, in order to fish a planer in line, you must remember that you are putting a tremendous amount of strain on that tackle. Even a small planer, relatively small, a number three, puts a ton of strain on your tackle. You cannot go out there with, don't move. You cannot go out there with a 20 pound conventional outfit and think that you're gonna attach this to a number three planer and this is gonna be an effective rod. It's not. You need a heavy outfit that has a lot of drag, okay, that is capable of, of a tremendous amount of strain. It took me, I'm going to tell you, three or four tries in building custom planer rods to get them just right. Exactly with the action that I was looking for and plenty of drag pressure. I fish a large reel, an Alu Technos 30. It's loaded with 100 pound braid, okay, 100 pound braid. It's got a 200 pound ball bearing swivel, eight foot rod, a lot of beef to this rod. It's really, really heavy. Okay, because I'm putting a ton of strain on this rod when I'm pulling a large planer, especially the number sixes and the number eights. And remember, 
I like to go fast. When I'm pulling my planers, I'm usually trolling six, sometimes up to eight knots. So when you're trolling that fast with that much strain, you need some serious tackle. This is not, planer fishing is not about light tackle. Planer fishing is not about finesse. That's not what this is about. This is about meat fishing, okay? It really is. It's about putting fish in the boat. It's about meat fishing. And the reason the charter boats use this approach with, with heavy rods like this and heavy tackle is because think about their patrons, family from Wisconsin, hooked up to a sailfish. Ladies never fished a day before in her life. Put a light tackle rod in her hand and tell her to reel in that sailfish successfully. What's gonna happen? Okay, chances are you're gonna lose that fish. So they beef up their tackle, plus it speeds up the whole process. Okay, but keep in mind, one thing that's really important when you are hand lining that fish, again, I fished that outfit right there. When I bring that fish and that planer up out of the water, I've now hooked the fish, we're fighting it, we get it all the way up to the planer. It's now time to hand line that fish. One mistake that a lot of people do is they grab that line hand over hand and they put it in the boat. Okay, and they put it right in the boat, right by their feet. What's gonna happen? The fish is gonna take off, the line's gonna tangle around their feet, and zing, pow, and that's what's gonna happen. They're gonna bust that fish off. Some people take a five gallon bucket with water, and they'll leave it right in the corner of the boat, and they'll hand line it in, and they'll put the, water, the line in a bucket of water. What I like to do is, first of all, the boat is still moving forward, remember that. Whenever you are fishing planers, almost whenever you're trolling in general, you catch a fish, you may pull back that throttle, but that boat still has forward momentum. I am not in neutral. My boat is continuing to move forward. So I reach down, I grab the line, and I hand, hand over hand, back into the water. Kind of follow me? So as I'm hand over hand, that line is going right out behind the boat. So essentially, when I bring that fish up into the boat and we gaff it, I've got a long leader that's going out and coming all the way back. I put a new bait on, all I got to do is chuck it out and my leader unfolds. Everybody kind of follow me there? Okay, and I don't risk the line tangling around my feet. I don't risk, you know, a zing pow situation or anything like that. That's the best approach. But keep in mind, it's usually a two person approach. If you're out fishing on your own, you probably shouldn't be fishing two planers by yourself with nobody else on the boat. Okay, it's just too much work. You know, it's a team effort. So when you're putting out your planers, you know, we talked about the hand lining approach. <laughs> Let's talk about putting the planers out. We touched on the two different sizes. We know that we're gonna fish a smaller planer further back. We're gonna have a larger planer closer to the boat, which is gonna be deeper in the water column. Now let's talk about how we do that and how we let our line out. And you know what? You can be my little volunteer here, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have my rod in the rod holder and I'm going to simply take my heavy duty ball bearing swivel and connect it right to the planer. And again, this is the inline approach, okay, where I'm using the rod and fighting the fish right off the rod right to the planer and then I'm hand lining the fish from there. So this is now sitting right on my gunnel and if we're going to, you're our gunnel too, you're a rod holder and a gunnel, okay. Then I have a yo-yo right here with my leader. And on this yo-yo, on both ends of my leader is a small little 75 pound snap swivel. Now very important, it took me a long time to learn this one little detail that will make a very big difference in your catch ratio when you are fishing planers. My leader is 100 feet long, okay? It's 100 feet long and it's 50 pound fluorocarbon. That's it. 100 feet, 50 pounds. All right, I've tried the 50 foot approach, I've tried different lengths, and I've found that when you fish a long leader, you catch a lot more fish, a lot more fish. So in order to maintain that leader, because it's easy for a 100 foot coil to get into a big mess, right? You put it on a yo-yo, really, really simple. So this is now on the gunnel, I take my bait, and again, we're gonna talk a lot about baits in a second, and I simply clip my bait, which is already on a leader, to this little swivel, and I feed it out behind the boat. And this just simply unwinds right off of my yo-yo, all 100 feet. 
Now, of course, I need to be careful because if I'm not paying attention, what's going to happen to my leader? We all know. So obviously, you've got to pay attention, all right? I mean, come on, it, you know, I don't need to tell you that. You're looking down at your leader spool, you only have two more coils, pay attention. On the opposite end is a small, the same little snap. I simply take that snap and attach it right to the blade on my planer, okay? So now, my leader's done, this is what I'm using, I can reuse it many, many times until it gets damaged. If it's frayed on the end, you know, and I have to cut a couple feet off of it, I can easily do that because again, it's a long leader, it's 100 feet long. So this is really a important tool to help you be an efficient planer fisherman, okay? Once you catch that fish or you get a bite, as I mentioned, you simply hand line it hand over hand. The leader goes out behind the boat, you unhook your fish, you simply snap on another bait, which is already on a leader, and you reverse the process and you put it back out there. I can't stress enough how important it is to fish the, the proper tackle, you know, a heavy duty outfit when you're fishing these planers, especially the larger ones. I can't stress how important that long leader is. Okay, don't try and get away with a shorter leader. You certainly can do it, but remember you've got this flying through the water. Okay, this creates a lot of disturbance, a lot of what I call noise, right? This is really noisy going through the water. If this passes by that guy, you think he's gonna, you know, it's, it's not gonna attract him. If anything, it's gonna startle him and scare him. So in turn, I like my bait to be way, way back away from this. And you know, if that bait is not parallel with this planer, you know, in other words, if it's a couple feet higher, a couple feet lower, it makes no difference. All I know is it's well below the surface. Really important, okay? The line on the rod, also I want to point out, I know I mentioned the braid, do not fish planers with monofilament. It just doesn't work right. Why? Because monofilament has a ton of stretch. It's like a giant rubber band, really, really elastic. Well, when you have a planer that's creating so much drag below the surface, if you have a rubber band holding this, it's just a very ineffective approach. You need to fish braid, and like I said, anything lighter than 80 pound, and you're asking for trouble, especially when you get to these larger planers, and especially when you get to faster trolling speeds like six to eight knots. Okay, you guys will see, you guys all know you fish out of Hillsboro, you fish out of Port Everglades, you see these charter boats out there, they're buzzing around at six to eight miles an hour, sometimes even more, you know, zigzagging, doing circles. These guys think they own the ocean out here, right? Okay, trust me, they think they own the ocean out here. Okay. But again, it's because they've got the right tackle in place, you know, from a lot of years of trial and error. When we're putting them out, also our planers, again, we've got our short one that's closer to the surface, our deeper one. We're also fishing additional baits. We're not only fishing two planers, we also have some surface baits, some baits up on top, okay? But remember that we always set our planer baits first before we put our surface baits out. Why? Well, imagine this scenario. I've got a bait coming off of an outrigger. I've got another bait back here off of an outrigger. I've got a shotgun bait right down the middle. I've got a flat line here and a flat line here. So I've got five lines going out behind the boat with five baits. And now I want to deploy two planers. But remember that I've got to first let my bait out before the planer gets deployed into the water. So I'm going to have a bait with a hundred foot leader that is potentially going to get tangled with some of these other lines before I even put this in the water. So always get your deep baits down before you put your surface baits out. Now I'm sure somebody's going to ask me, Mike, because they already sent an email and asked me, they said, how do we trip the planer? Okay, when it's in the swimming position, in the fishing position like this, and if you'll do me a favor and just hold that real tight, I'm going to put some strain on there, okay? There's a tremendous amount of tension on this rod. I'm moving at six to eight knots. This is, you know, 40 feet, 30 feet below the surface. It's way out behind the boat. It's in this position right here. If you go to turn the handle on that reel, you can't even move this thing. Okay, you can't because, of course, it's the end of the day. You want to reel it in. You want to check your bait. One of the, you know, different scenarios, and you want to trip that planer. If you're fishing monofilament on your planer rod, you will never be able to trip the planer because of the elasticity 
in that outfit. But with braid, you can do it. You can take the rod out of the rod holder, point the rod at the planer, and you can, I'm not saying this is gonna work every time, but you can attempt to lift that rod, high stick it, lift it really high and drop it. And what happens sometimes when you do that, it pulls the planer up and drops it. And now you can reel it in. But it could never happen with monofilament. And again, it's not, sometimes they're, I gotta tell you, anybody ever fish planers and find that they're a pain in the butt to trip? Right? I mean, he's raising his hand because he's right. It, it happens. There's times where it's very, very frustrating to get that planer to trip, but you can do it. Like I said, just high stick that rod real quick, drop it back down, and oftentimes that planer will just trip and you'll be able to reel it back up to the boat. Another thing when you're setting the planer, I've seen many people having problems setting the planer. They put it in the water, but every time they put it in the water, the planer goes like this. Or I'll kind of hold it up, you know, they put it in next to the boat and it goes like this, okay? And they can't get it to, to you know, to, to get in the right position in order to dive. Slow down, take your time, okay? Look at what's happening because usually what happens, you've got that leader, that 100 foot leader coming off the back of the planer, your bait's back there, so right out of the gate, you've got that strain of that leader pulling that planer into the tripped position. If you just drop this over the side like this, what's gonna happen? It's just gonna swim like this, okay? So either make sure that this planer is in the correct position when you slowly ease it into the water and then it will grab, or if you go into the water, even in this tripped position, slack off real quick and let out five or 10 feet of line and it'll go Okay, you kind of follow me? If you slack off real quick, it'll go and the weight will take it down and it'll catch. So it's a matter of trial and error. Every rod and reel is different. Every boat's different. Every angler's different. It's going to be up to you to get dialed in as to how to do that. And have a little bit of tension on your drag. Absolutely. And have some tension on your drag or else your reel's going to go whoop, you know, and you're going to have uh, what we call a professional overrun. Okay? It's a nice way to say it. So planers are really, really important, you know, when you're dialed in and you've got the right tackle and it's all working right, it, it's an awesome experience that could be really productive. When you're using the wrong tackle, it's a nightmare, okay? It's a nightmare and you'll never do it again. So it's very important that you pay attention to the details. Where do we fish planers? 90% of the time, right out front from 75 feet to about 300 feet. That 90% of the time, when we're fishing planers, it's out front on what we call the edge. Okay, 75 to 300 feet. We'll zigzag in that area. If we start picking up fish in 120 to 150, obviously we're gonna focus our efforts in that 120 to 150 kind of zone. If we're picking up fish in 180 to 220, we're gonna focus our efforts in that area. So of course we're gonna modify our approach to what we're seeing out on the water. When we're offshore dolphin fishing, we'll also fish a planer. That's, that's the other 10% because 90% is when we're inshore. That other 10% is we'll be offshore dolphin fishing out in the Gulf Stream and we'll fish one planer, not two in that scenario, right down the middle to get a deep bait below the surface. Sometimes we can't do it because if I'm fishing only artificial lures, I'm often trolling at eight to 10 knots. And at 10 knots, it's very challenging to pull that planer below the surface. You're, you're pushing the limits of planer fishing, okay? But under other circumstances, certainly when you're out there dolphin fishing and trolling, don't be afraid to fish that planer because that deep bait is really important in your trolling spread offshore. But for the most part, it's in that shallower water right on the edge, 75 to 300 feet. We're primarily targeting king mackerel and wahoo. Those are the two primary species that we're targeting when we're planer fishing. What baits are we using? Well, you've got a lot of different options here. When we're fishing planers, we never fish live bait. We never fish live goggle eyes or blue runners off the planers. Why? Don't trip the planer, okay? So we only fish rig baits. And most of the time, those rig baits are either one of two things. Bonita strip, okay, which is the primary, most prevalent bait that you're gonna fish off a planer is just a very simple Bonita strip. 
with a little skirt over the top of it, single or a double hook, little piece of wire, why wire? Okay, we all know why wire, right? Because of course we're targeting fish with teeth. Okay, but I'm gonna talk to you about that a little bit more in a second. But when it comes to the Bonita strips, very simple, extremely effective, 90% of the time, these small little Bonita strips will crush it. Okay, but there are also some other options. And keep in mind, you know, there's that theory of, I wanna fish a big bait because I wanna catch a big fish. Right, everybody, I wanna catch a big fish, so I'm gonna fish a big bait. But you know, you need to look at it a different way. What is the prevalent forage out here? A lot of pilchards, a lot of herring, a lot of sardines, a lot of small mackerel, small bait fish. That's why these small strip baits work so well, because they mimic the local forage in the area. Even looks like a small little bonita, like a little baby bonita flying through the water. The reason it has a skirt over the top, and this can be a little octopus skirt with a little sinker in the head. It could be a sea witch, and we're gonna talk about sea witches a lot in a second. But anything over top of that bonita strip. Why? Because it prevents that bonita strip from washing out, okay? And other, so that bait is gonna be, it's gonna last longer in the water column. It's gonna prevent the bait from washing out. It's also gonna give the bait a little bit of a larger profile and make it look like a little bait, a little bit of a bigger bait. It's got some color, it's got some, you know, you can have flash, you can do all sorts of things with these little skirts. They're obviously on the wall. There's an endless variety of these little skirts that you can put on top of Bonita strips. You can rig them yourself or you can purchase them pre-rigged, okay? Of course, nothing beats, you know, rigging the baits yourself with fresh Bonitas, but if you don't have the tools, if you don't have the knowledge, by the pre-rigged ones. Another thing that we'll often fish, especially when we're targeting the wahoo, is a split tail mullet. Okay, dead mullet, split tail mullet, great swimming bait, again on wire. It's got a little sinker right in the nose to help it swim right. This will not trip the planer, and you'll catch a lot of big kings and a lot of wahoo on these split tail mullet. Great time in the fall, the upcoming fall mullet run is a great time, obviously, to go out and load up on mullet that you can put in your freezer and you can rig down the line. If you're not sure how to rig all of these baits also, you can check out our YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe to our magazine because we teach you all of that stuff. Now, my absolute favorite bait when I'm trolling the planers is a ballyhoo. Just a single ballyhoo with a sea witch on mono. On mono. Now we just talked about fishing these baits on wire because the king mackerel and the wahoo have the teeth obviously and we don't want to get cut off. What I have learned over the years and what I can pretty much guarantee you is you will, get, you will get twice as many bites fishing straight mono as you will wire. Okay, twice as many bites. Are you going to lose a fish here and there? Yes. Okay, however, even if you fish wire, has anybody ever lost a fish on wire? Of course, okay? You're going to lose fish on wire too because sometimes they'll come up and you know, they'll, they'll bite through the wire, the wire will kink, you don't have a long enough wire leader, so they'll bite through that wire also sometimes and you won't catch every one of those fish. I would rather get 20 bites than 10 bites. How about you guys, okay? I'd rather get more bites. That's why I fish a long 50 pound leader. It's thin, gives that line a lot of mobility, a very stealthy, natural approach. And I like to fish the single hook ballyhoo with nothing but a little sea witch. Okay, these sea witches come in an endless array of colors, uh, different sizes, purples, pinks. They come in 16th of an ounce, quarter ounce, half ounce, all the way on up to an ounce and even larger. Just don't make the mistake of putting the sea witch over top of your ballyhoo like this. It actually goes like this. It looks like it's backwards, but that's what you want because it'll flare, has a nice flare. So as that bait is swimming through the water, that sea witch will flare. It'll pulse and it brings that dead bait to life. It gives it a lot of flash. It protects that bait, prevents it from washing out as quickly. Okay. And again, it attracts fish because it has some flash in it. And same thing as those little squid skirts, those sea witches are available in an endless array. Here, this is for you. I'm not kidding. Okay. Comes in an endless array of different colors. You know, I like the purples. I like the pinks. 
Sometimes when the water is clear, I like a brighter color. When it's dirty, I like a dirtier color. And you may be saying, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. If the water is dirty, wouldn't you want to use a brighter color? And my answer is no, because when the water is dirty and stained, everything is muted. All of the bait fish, everything is muted. So I want to really mimic the forage in the area. So instead, I use a darker color when that water is kind of that off green. And when it's really crystal clear and that nice clean blue, I'll use the brighter colors like the pinks. But don't be afraid to mix it up, okay? And of course, trial and error will tell you what works best for you. Very, very simple. You can buy rigged ballyhoo if you can't rig them yourself. If you don't want to rig them yourself, you can buy rigged ballyhoo. Just simply take the leader, snip off the top, slide a sea witch down over top of it, tie a loop or crimp a loop back into the top of the leader and snap that right onto your swivel on your leader coil on your yo-yo, okay? Pretty much that simple. So that really makes up the majority of the live baits. Now there are a couple other options too that are really effective. Spoons, little Clark spoons, little trolling spoons. These have been around forever and they're killer. They're absolutely killer. These things have crazy action in the water. They, it's not a tight wobble, it's like a crazy wobble. Okay, really, really, uh, you know, very effective. They've been around a long time. If you're gonna fish planers, make sure you have a couple of these spoons. Sometimes they'll allow produce the, the rigged natural baits as well. Just let me forewarn you, make sure you do not have two of the same size planers running parallel with two spoons. <laughs> okay, because I'm telling you, you're asking for it, pal. Okay, you're asking for it. You're gonna have a giant mess. Okay, because they will tangle each other. So again, if you're only fishing one planer, not a problem at all. If you're gonna fish two, you know, just consider just putting one spoon on one of them. Another option is just a small swim bait, like a Rapala X-Rap. I've used these off the planers, but with the small lip. Not the big deep diving, not the X-Rap Magnums, why? Because what's gonna happen with that big deep diving plug? It's gonna trip the planer. But I have found that the small lip swimming plugs, like the regular X-Wrap, work really, really well. And again, what's cool about it, you don't have to worry about natural bait. You don't have to worry about live bait, dead bait, smelly bait, any bait. Okay, you can go out there and catch fish just on artificial lures. Okay, and have an opportunity to catch the same fish, the kingfish, the wahoo, the blackfin tuna, will all crush these baits, okay, as long as they're presented properly. One last thing, and then we're going to move on here. Still a lot to talk about. I, I didn't mention with the ballyhoo. Another thing that I like to do is I put a skirted lure over the top of it instead of the sea witch, something like an Islander style lure. There's a lot of different companies that make this type of lure. You know, Chaos has their own line of lures that are similar to this. They all work. Again, what you're doing is you're covering up that ballyhoo, you're preventing it from washing out as quickly, you're creating a larger profile, more flash, more appeal, you're bringing that dead bait to life. But the one important factor about these is make sure you use the bullet style head when you're pulling those ballyhoo off the planers, not the flat concave chugger style heads. Those are better suited for ballyhoo that are fished up on the surface. For deep baits, fish the bullet head style lures. So speed, you know, is another really important thing on these planers is pulling them at the right speed. Like I said, I like that at least six knots because I like to cover ground. Plus the faster I'm going, the less likely that fish has an opportunity to realize he's being duped, okay? You want that impulse strike. You want that fish to see that bait coming by, to see that strip bait coming by, the ballyhoo, whatever it is that you're pulling. And you want him to just instinctively say, I need to reach out and grab that bait before it's gone as fast as I possibly can. So I like the speed factor. You'll also find that you'll catch more of the blackfin tunas, you know, on the planers when you're going a little bit faster as well. There's no one perfect trolling speed. It all depends on the conditions, depends on the boat that you're in, depends on the baits that you're pulling, depends on a lot of different factors. You know, obviously when it's rough, what happens when you go down sea with planers? Okay, as you're, if I'm looking off the stern of my boat 
and I'm going down C, so obviously the waves and, you know, are pushing me this way. As I come down off each wave, I'm creating even more stress on those rods. And a lot of times you'll get, you'll get what we call creep. You know, your reel, the line will creep off the reel because of the extra strain that you're putting on it with the planers. So you have to constantly monitor your reels because it's real easy if you're at the wheel and never looking back there at what's happening and you're going down C for a half hour. Oh, shit. Okay. And you look back and there's 800 yards of line gone. Okay. And you had no idea. So obviously put the clicker on and pay attention to what's going on behind you. I don't need to tell you that. You know, it, the fundamentals, you're fishermen, you all know that already. So again, planers, real effective. You can fish them in line. You can fish them off the cleat, you know, and this way you can fight the fish directly. One last thing I want to mention about planers, there is a new bridle system that we're you know, I don't want to say we're using it regularly. I've tried it, but as I mentioned earlier, I like the whole hand lining approach, okay? But there is a bridle system in place that we created where you can fish that planer right in line. And then when that planer comes out of the water, when you're fighting a fish, you simply unclip it off your leader and now you can reel that entire leader back onto the reel without the encumbrance of the planer, okay? little complicated it's got to be rigged properly and very detailed because if your loop is just a couple of inches too long the planer will never trip so again there are some different options there but the bottom line really important to have in your arsenal you're not going to use them all of the time summertime right now you've got to get baits deep below the surface so let's move on to the next option downriggers okay downriggers Really, really cool device, a downrigger, designed for controlled depth fishing. That's what this is. It's designed to get your baits deeper below the surface, but in a much more controlled fashion than a planer. What do I mean by controlled? Well, for starters, you can see on all downriggers, there's a gauge, okay? That gauge does not tell me how deep in the water column my bait is, it's telling me how much line is off this spool. So don't use it as a precise gauge of how deep your bait is, just use it as a reference. And we're gonna get more into that in a second. Downriggers, available in two versions, electric, power, okay, or manual, okay? Here are the benefits of each and the cons of each. With an electric downrigger, when I want to retrieve that ball, I push a button. Okay, pretty much that simple. I push a button, the ball comes up. When the ball reaches the surface of the water, it stops. So I don't have to worry about the ball being reeled all the way up into the tip of the outrigger and breaking. Okay, has that ever happened to anybody? Okay, so the ball stops right at the surface. That's really the biggest benefit of an electric downrigger is having that option to be able to just push that button. And keep in mind, they've become so sophisticated where now you can have that button right up on the dash. So I could be running the boat, one of my guys is in the stern, he hooks a fish, I never have to leave the wheel. I could just push a button and it will retrieve that downrigger. Okay? I could also take that Canon downrigger, these, you know, really one of the most, if not the most advanced electric downriggers, and I can integrate it with my electronics, my display. So I can control the depth of the downrigger right from my display. If I'm going over a hump or a ridge or a depression and I want it to go down, I want it to come up, I can simply push a button and literally move that ball up and down right on the screen, okay? Nice feature. However, is this going to help you catch more fish? No, it's not. It's just nice benefits. But with those benefits comes a downside. You've got to pay. Okay, you've got to pay for all of those benefits. Okay, for all of that integration. And it becomes so complicated where it really is almost too complicated. Okay, so that whole thing of using these electric downriggers integrated with your screens and being able to do this and do that, whew, way too much for me. Okay, I want to fish. I don't want to sit there and go, give me a manual so I can figure out how to do this. I want to fish. 
But again, the electric is nice because all you have to do is push a button. It's it, you know really nice even when you hook a fish, you can stand right in that corner and just push a button, you know, and it retrieves that ball. So again, that's really the, the biggest benefit. Most electric downriggers, when you purchase them, they come with wire cable on the spool. Okay, why? Because that electric downrigger actually puts out a charge in the water column through that wire cable. There's an electrical charge that's being put out into the water. And they claim that that electrical charge does what? Okay. Okay. They say it attracts fish. Okay. There is a downside to that electrical cable, or I should say that wire cable on the electric downriggers, and that is, is that it has a very, very loud hum, really loud hum. Okay. As you are trolling a downrigger with the cable, you will hear what sounds like a small motor running, a, a really annoying hum, and that is created from that wire cable being dragged through the water. Personally, I've had electric downriggers. I now fish the manual downriggers, but even when I had the electric ones, I ripped all of the cable off of it and loaded it with braid. Okay, so I would highly suggest that you do that on any of your downriggers. Get rid of the cable. It's a pain in the butt to work with. It doesn't get your bait any deeper than braid. Even if they tell you, yes, it does because it's heavier than braid. No, it doesn't because braid is thinner than the cable. So it has less resistance and your bait's going to swim deeper. Okay, get rid of that cable and load your downrigger with braid. Nothing less than 200 pound. 200 pound is probably perfect. Don't go 50 pound, don't go 80 pound, because you're gonna ultimately lose your downrigger balls and it's gonna create a mess. So 200 pound is the right braid for your downrigger setup. Getting back to the electric versus manual. With the electric, you obviously have to power it. That could either be with an external battery, which is a pain in the butt, hardwire it with a plug, a 12 volt plug under the, you know, under the gunnel is the easiest approach. They do not draw a lot of power, and it's only really temporary power as soon as it's bringing the ball up. So it's not a power issue, but obviously you have to make sure your boat's rigged properly and wired properly to have that outlet in order to power that electric downrigger that costs four to five times as much as a manual downrigger and weighs four to five times as much. But it's nice to be able to just push that button, okay? On those electric ones, there's a little readout that tells you, again, the same thing, how many revolutions that that spool turns, so you can use that as a gauge. Another option is the manual downrigger. This is an old, well, let me rephrase that. The design is originally a Penn Fathom Master. This has been the staple of manual downriggers for many, many years. For whatever reason, which I'm not aware of, Penn stopped making these. So they sold the rights and the actual design of the product to a company called Seahorse. So Seahorse Trollmaster Downriggers are exactly the same as the old Pen Fathom Masters. I bring that up because I know a lot of guys have had these old pens on their boat and if they're looking for parts, a new handle, whatever, they can get those from Seahorse because it's exactly the same unit. So what's nice about the manual one is, first of all, it's light, really, really light. Very easy to put on the boat, two of them, take them off the boat when you're not using them. This obviously slides right into a rod holder. It has a swivel base, okay, so you can turn it for any direction. Obviously, to turn it out, to deploy it, or to turn it back in when you're running, has a very easy handle very big crank and the way that it's geared it's very easy to reel up that 10 pound ball don't think this is like oh my god my arm's gonna fall off on the contrary it's really really smooth really really easy it's geared properly and i have to tell you my experience with these manual seahorse downriggers has been nothing but excellent they're very durable they're light they work okay and they're really affordable they're like a couple hundred bucks or something like that so if you're not already fishing a downrigger, this may be a great entry-level product, even though it's not entry-level, but dollars and cents-wise, it may be a great way for you to get into downrigger fishing. Obviously, a big wheel up on top. 
make sure, you know, with any downrigger that you have, pay attention to the components. You know, the only thing that salt water doesn't deteriorate <laughs> is salt water. Okay, I don't care what it is. Neglect anything enough and salt water will destroy it. So some corrosion block, you know, on the moving parts, some lubrication, rinse it off. I don't need to tell you that, you know, take care of the stuff and it'll take care of you. So at the end of this downrigger, we obviously have a couple different options as to what we're going to deploy. It could either be a heavy ball, okay, usually 10 pounds, 8 pounds, sometimes as heavy as 12 pounds, okay, these are sometimes just round, sometimes they have the little fin right on the back with a little bit of flash, not necessary, but either way, just a heavy, you know, often plastic covered lead ball. The average size that we use out here is eight pounds, okay? The eight pound size is usually perfect for out here for what we're trying to achieve. You don't need the 12 pound one. Five pounds is a little bit light. Another option is what's called a Z-wing, okay? This weighs about one pound. But the design of this Z-wing is what forces this to plane through the water, to dive deep in the water column. It's the design of this shape right here, this unique shape. So you really have two different options. You can use the lead ball, which if you drop it, is gonna scratch your deck, or you can use a Z-wing, okay, which obviously is a lot lighter and a lot easier to work with. Both will do the trick. Both will get your baits deeper in the water column. It's a matter of preference. We've used both, and at the end of the day, I cannot say that I've had more success with the Z-Wing or more success with the ball. What I can tell you is this is just easier to work with, okay, and lighter and easier to work with. Another thing that's important is I never connect my line to the actual ball or to the Z-Wing itself. So for example, can you be my gunnel again? Okay. So the way that I have my downrigger rigged. There you go. Okay. So down on the bottom is a really heavy swivel. This is what's going to connect to my ball or to my Z-wing, whatever it is that I'm deploying. And about four feet up, I put a three-way swivel in line. If you'll do me a favor, we're just going to back off on that. There we go, okay. And I'll tell you why I do this. So again, down here is my ball, right down here. And about four feet up, a three-way swivel, and this is where I connect my release clip. So why do I do that? Because when this is on the gunnel, on the side of my boat, if I don't want to have to reach down and lift that ball or that Z-wing and deal with that while the boat's rocking back and forth, it's too easy for that ball to hit the side of my CB and that's not gonna make me happy. Okay, so I like to keep the ball in the water the entire time. So as you can see right now, the ball is in the water and this is right at waist level, so to speak. I can simply reach out, grab this, I've got my release line, this is where I'm putting the line from my rod and my ball is down there. Really simple procedure. Again, you don't have to do this, but it just makes working with, working with downriggers a heck of a lot easier than if you're connecting this right to the ball itself, okay? When you put your line on this release clip, these are very, very simple to work with. You just pinch them and they open up. The further that you insert your line into that release clip, the more tension it's going to require, the more... Uh, you know, power it's gonna to require to pull that out of the release clip. But keep in mind, if you put it just on the end, it'll pop out very easily. So I recommend putting it way in there because remember when that fish strikes, you want that little bit of tension to be able to hook that fish before it pops out. Because as soon as your line pops out of this release clip, you're not tight to the rod tip, are you? Okay, you're not, you've got a ton of slack. And let me explain why. So for example, and I'll get this out of your hands. For example, when I am deploying 
my downrigger. The first thing I'm going to do is let out my bait, and that could be on a 20-pound conventional outfit, this Chaos uh, KC 15 to 30 rod. It's a seven-foot rod. You've seen us use this in so many different venues. This is the rod that we use when we're fishing downriggers. Daiwa Saltiga size 50 loaded with 20-pound diamond line. High-vis line, I like that high-vis whenever we're trolling, makes it easier to see all of the different lines. Just a tiny little 50-pound ball bearing snap swivel. So if I'm fishing something on a leader, a strip bait, a rigged ballyhoo, I just obviously pop it on there, I'm good to go. Or if we're fishing live baits, because with downriggers, we often slow troll live baits, okay? Because we don't risk the, the problem of the live bait tripping the, the planer. Because remember, when we're fishing planers, those live baits will trip the planers. With the downriggers, we don't have that problem. So we like to fish live baits often, goggle eyes and blue runners, with the actual downriggers when we're using downriggers. So our rig in this particular case is a stinger rig. Stinger rig is a typical 7.0 J-hook up on top, about six to eight inches, a 44 pound American fishing wire, single strand. You certainly can use titanium. We've used titanium, works exceptionally well, harder to work with, about three or four times the cost, but will last a lot longer. So there's pros and cons to it. It's flexible, really easy to, to you know, uh, or I should say really hard to kink. You know, so again, there's some benefits to titanium, but single strand wire has been around forever. Very simple to tie knots in, a regular you know, hay wire twist, and it'll get the job done. So on the bottom is a number two BMC Fish Fighter treble hook. Right above that is a number seven, or I should say a 7.0 BMC inline live bait hook. The 7.0 hook goes through the nostrils of the bait. The treble hook goes back by its tail. The stinger rig is very important because when you are slow trolling live baits, king mackerel are notorious for doing what? Chopping a bait in half, baby. They are so good at that. They're so good at cutting that bait right behind that hook. Right? Have you? I brought up baits. I'm like, how the hell did you do that? I mean, you chopped that bait another centimeter, you'd be dead meat. Okay? But you did it. You deserve to live. Okay? They're so good at that. So you have to have that treble hook, that stinger, right in the back of that bait. But be careful. You don't want that little piece of wire to be too short because if you prevent that bait from swimming properly, if that back stinger is too short and you are binding the bait, the bait's going to die and it's going to spin. And the last thing you want is an $8 goggle eye that was live five minutes ago now spinning through the water like this. You might as well not fish live bait. You might as well fish a ballyhoo. Okay, so if you are gonna fish the live bait again, use the stinger, just be careful as to how you hook that bait so you do not restrict its fishability, its mobility through the water. At, on top of the 7.0, we've got about 20 inches of that same 44 pound wire. When I'm kite fishing, I use a shorter length. When I'm slow trolling live baits off the downrigger, I use a longer length. Why? Because the king mackerel and the wahoo are notorious for charging that bait from the back. And when they charge that bait from the back, they push it up the line. Okay? And if you don't have long enough wire, they often cut you off right even above the wire. It's happened even here. So you got to find that balance because some guys will say, well, then why don't you just fish six feet of wire? Okay, because that's too much. Then I can't achieve that nice natural presentation. So it's all about balance. Anyhow, it's from the top of my wire, which is connected with a very streamlined Albright knot. You can see not a lot of hardware, nice and clean. Okay, I don't like hardware. I try and avoid terminal tackle as much as I possibly can. The less junk in the water, the better. Okay. From there, I've got 40 pound diamond presentation fluorocarbon. And you can see it goes all the way to thank you, all the way to there. Okay, so I've got about 10 to 12 feet of 40 pound fluorocarbon. Why? Because I'm fishing that high vis line. And the high vis line has a benefit. It allows me to see that line, but it also allows the fish to see the line. So I want to make sure that there's a buffer between the high-vis line and between my bait. So I've got 10 to 12 feet 
of the clear 40 pound fluorocarbon. So when I'm deploying the downrigger, the first thing I'm going to do is obviously hook my live bait and I'm going to feed them out behind the boat while the boat is obviously moving forward. Okay. Got one. Got, one. got a big one, about 220 pounds. Okay. <laughs> Well, all right, 225, come on. All right. So anyhow, as I feed that bait out, and I'm gonna get that bait out 100 feet behind the boat. Same thing, I want my live bait way out behind my downrigger, or behind the downrigger ball, or the Z-wing. I don't want it anywhere near that ball. I want it way back there. So I'm gonna feed this out, get it back about 100 feet. I'm gonna put this in a rod holder with the clicker on, right? Clicker's on. The rod's in free spool with the clicker on, okay? And the bait's swimming out behind the boat. My downrigger is now ready to go. I'm gonna reach out, I'm gonna grab the clip. Not the ball, because the ball's in the water, because it's four feet below the clip, so it's very easy to grab the clip. I'm gonna clip it right onto my line, and now you have to use a little, you know, kind of, uh, uh, what's the right word? You know, you know the phrase of uh, rubbing your belly and rubbing your head at the same time? Well, that's what you've got to do because now this is in a rod holder and with my left hand, I'm going to slowly ease that ball down into the depths. With my right hand, I'm going to make sure that as this is coming off the spool, that it's not backlashing. And I mean, obviously with a lever drag reel, even with a star drag reel, you can certainly adjust the tension, but just be careful. If you let that ball rip as fast as it can go, what's going to happen? This reel is going to go zing, and you're going to get another one of those professional overruns, okay? Big fat backlash. So slow down, take your time, common sense, okay? Fish properly, the fundamentals. Get that ball down there, look at the gauge. So what I do, because again, we're always fishing two downriggers. I like to cover the depths. I never fish them side by side because I don't want to jeopardize that tangle. So I may fish one of them on the 50 number and one of them on the 80 number. Does that mean I'm 50 and 80 feet below the surface? No. It simply is a reference for me to know that this one's at the 50 revolutions, this one's at the 80. If I get a bite on the 50 over and over and over, obviously I'm going to adjust accordingly. But I use those numbers as a reference. Once you release that ball and you get it down to the desired depth, and you now lock up that downrigger. If it's electric, obviously you're just pushing a button. If it's with this manual one, you're turning a dial, but basically you're locking up the downrigger, the ball's in that position. Now my line is coming off my rod tip and it's obviously going down to the release clip and then 100 feet back. Well, keep in mind, I wanna reduce that bow of line that's going from the rod tip to the release clip. I want that to be as vertical as it possibly can be. I don't want a big bow of line in there. So slowly, I'm just gonna reel up some of the tension, some of the slack, okay, until that rod loads up, until I can clearly see that that line is going right down to that release clip, and then from there, out and back to the fish. But now when a fish eats the bait, a hundred feet back there and that pops out of the release clip, there's a lot of slack. There's a lot of slack line. So you need to react quickly. Oftentimes, this rod will be bent over, down, you'll see the bite, pop. It'll pop right out, trust me, you'll know you're getting a bite. You, you guys know that, you know you're getting a bite. Grab that rod and just crank like crazy. Try and get all of that slack line out as quickly as you can in order to come tight to the fish in order to bury those hooks in that fish's mouth. Okay, really important. Not saying if you do nothing, you're gonna lose that fish because a lot of times you'll still catch them, you know, you'll still hook them because the boat's still moving forward and it's just a matter of time before the boat catches up with all of that line, obviously, and you do come tight to that fish. Once you hooked up to that fish, it's up to you to decide if you, you know, have an electric downrigger, obviously you push the button, you bring the ball up, with the manual one, you can bring it up right there and then, or you can wait, but ultimately you've got to bring it back up to the surface to obviously reset that bait. One important factor to consider when we're slow trolling, and when I say slow trolling, when we're pulling goggle eyes and blue runners, we never ever slow troll pilchards off of our downriggers because they're too weak. They'll die, okay? You, you can't drop a pilchard 
50 feet below the surface and pull him around at any speed and expect him to live. He's going to die. You're going to bring him back up and he's going to be like all bent in half, okay? Yeah, his eyes are going to be popped out. He's going to be gone. So we're, we have to fish a hardy bait, like a blue runner or a goggle eye, something that's hardy, that can handle it. But we're only pulling those baits at two or three knots. Very, very slow. Never more than three knots. Never, okay? Sometimes I've got a, a 37 CV with triple 350s. Oftentimes I've got to kill one of my motors, okay? Just because, just to go slow enough. Because if you've got three knots of current, you're moving at three knots, you know, before you do anything. So you've got to take that into consideration. You know, a lot of the guys, a lot of the uh, SKA guys, the professional king mackerel fishermen, you know, they know how important it is to fish downriggers for king mackerel. You've never, you'll never see a professional king mackerel fisherman that doesn't have downriggers on his boat, okay? Because they know that that's where all these big fish come from, is deeper in the water column with big live baits. But the point I'm making is they troll slow, and sometimes they'll even take a five-gallon bucket and throw it out behind the boat on a rope just to help them slow down even more. Because if you troll too fast, what's going to happen to your bait? You're going to kill them. You're going to drown them and kill them. And then again, you're going to have a goggle eye that's spinning through the water like this in a giant mess. Okay, so you've got to slow it down. You want that bait to be swimming, but to be swimming naturally. You're trying to achieve that natural approach. Also keep in mind that there are many scenarios where trolling with the current, you'll get more bites than if you troll against the current. Okay, why is that? Because fish tend to swim with the current, right? Even bait tends to swim with the current. So sometimes you can fish a particular area, say 150 feet between Hillsborough Inlet and Boca Inlet, and you can slow troll live baits going north and not get a single bite. Turn around and head back south down the exact same path and you'll catch fish. And the pattern will repeat itself over and over, okay, on different occasions. So that tells you that there are certainly days where moving in one direction versus the other can make a big difference. So don't be afraid to try that out. With the downriggers, you also control the strip baits. You also control the, the ballyhoo with the islander type lure or with the uh, sea witches. Absolutely you can do that and you control faster. But remember that ideally when you look off the side and you're looking at the angle of that line coming off of the downrigger, you never want to exceed about 30, about 30 degrees. You always want it to be as vertical as it can possibly be. If that line is way back there, you've got too much what we call blowback. That's what that's called. When that line off that downrigger is way out there, it's called blowback. You're either going too fast, you don't have enough line out, or your lead ball isn't heavy enough. So you have to compensate in some way, okay? And usually it's by slowing down, okay? Too much blowback. So speed-wise, like I said, when you're fishing the, the rig baits, you control faster. You can do four, five, six knots, sometimes even a little bit faster, depending on the conditions. And also depending on your particular setup. If you've got an old boat and it has rod holders that are not through bolted, okay, and you put a tremendous amount of strain on a downrigger in that rod holder, something could potentially fail. Okay, and obviously you don't want that to happen. So there's a lot of different factors that come into play. But if you've got the right boat, you know, you've got the right rod holders, everything's mounted properly, don't be afraid to bump up the speed. But just like with fishing planers, a lot of things are really similar. You set those downrigger baits first, and you retrieve those downrigger baits last. Okay, so my surface baits, because I'm always fishing surface baits up on top, along with those deep baits, because I'm trying to create that three-dimensional presentation, those deep baits are always the first down and always the last up, okay? It's the same with both of them. We talked about, a lot, you know, again, a lot with the different baits, a lot of different options there. With the downriggers, too, you even have more options with swimming plugs and spoons, you know, and all sorts of different lures that you can pull off the downriggers. 
Um, but it's really hard to beat the natural bait approach. If I had to pick just one, it'd probably be a tie between the Bonita strip or the Ballyhoo with the Sea Witch. And really, if I chose between these two, I'd go with the Ballyhoo with the Sea Witch. Okay, I'd keep it simple. You know, sometimes we do, we've got like a, a five rod approach that's simple, it's only five rods. And I say that it's simple, only five rods, because there's times we're trolling and we'll fish 12 lines at times. So with five rods, we've got two deep baits off the down riggers, we've got two baits off the out riggers, and one shotgun down the middle. That's it, very simple, five baits. And they're all ballyhoo. And guess what eats ballyhoo? Everything. everything. So you're going out there targeting everything. Okay, it's a meat fishing approach. That's what it is. It's about catching fish. And you know, it's great when you can wake up and say, you know, today, today, I'm gonna go out there and I'm only gonna target Wahoo. And I'm only gonna catch Wahoo. I don't care about anything else. And you go out there and you catch Wahoo, okay? Or you go, today, I'm gonna go catch a golden tile fish and nothing else. I just want to catch a golden tile fish. And you go out there and catch that golden tile fish. Or you say, I'm going to go mutton snapper fishing. And you catch just mutton snapper. That's an awesome experience. And I love doing that, you know, getting what I call zeroed in. Zero in, okay, on exactly what you want to do and exactly how you want to do it. That is not what this is about. This is about going out and catching whatever will bite. Because you know what, some days it will be the dolphin, some days it'll be the sailfish, some days it'll be kingfish, some days it'll be wahoo or blackfin tuna, some days it'll be all bonitas, okay? Be all bonitas. You'll get so tired of catching bonitas, okay? But, you know, I gotta tell you, I mean, A, it's really good bait, like he said, and where there are bonita, there are also other game fish because the bonitas are, are predatory, migratory game fish that has to eat. So if they're there, Blackfin tunas are very likely there. Other game fish are likely there. The bonitas are just so much more prevalent that they're getting to your baits before everything else is. But again, it's a great all around approach. And you know, I like to say, I say this in every seminar and I'm gonna end this seminar with this same phrase. One fish, one, can make a huge difference in the outcome of your trip. If you go out there and fish a downrigger or a planer and you catch one 40 pound smoker king mackerel or a beautiful sailfish or a chunky you know, blackfin tuna or a big wahoo, that one fish can change the outcome of the whole day, especially if you didn't catch anything else all day, right? You know, sometimes that one fish can make or break the whole day or it could be the kicker. You know, you catch some you know, decent fish and then you've got that really one good quality one to just top it all off. So it's all about that one fish. And getting that fish, and really all fish, you know, another thing that I want to mention is how important angler failure and tackle failure are in the overall equation. We talked about a lot of different things. We talked a lot about planers and downriggers, and we touched on rods and line and reels and rigs, but there's so much more to it. This is a science, okay? There's a lot of effort that goes into all of this, drag settings, making sure that the line is fresh, because any weak link, anybody ever lose a fish because their line was frayed? Come on, come on, work with me, everybody raise their hand. Okay, everybody has lost fish because their line was frayed. Anybody ever lose a fish because their knot was bad and a knot, you know, broke? All of these little things, or anybody ever lose a fish because there's a nice fish up next to the boat and you've got a gaff in your hand and you swung at it 13 times. 13, and on the 14th time, you finally wrapped the end of the gaff around the leader and broke the fish off. And your buddy's looking at you about to kill you, okay? Angler failure, tackle failure, these things enter the equation not only when you're downrigger and planer fishing, but in all venues, and at the end of the day, they cost you fish. So if you just eliminated angler failure and tackle failure from the equation as a whole, you're gonna be a more successful angler, okay? If you're properly prepared, you're gonna be a more successful angler, okay? Also keep in mind if you go out there and you try these tactics and they don't work, you know, on the first go around and you're not successful, don't give up, keep trying. You know, keep getting dialed in, try and figure out why didn't it work? What did I do wrong? I'm gonna tell you a real quick story and we're gonna wrap this up and then we'll do our raffle. 
I moved here from New Jersey many, many years ago. And I thought I was a hot shot. I was a big time fisherman in New Jersey, spent hundreds of days out in the canyons, caught everything up to 824 pound giant bluefin tuna on stand up gear and everything in between. And I came down to Florida 20 some odd years ago and I'm like, I got this figured out. You know what I caught for the first three years? Three fish in three years, okay? Obviously more than three, but not a lot more than three. And I was so frustrated because I was using all of the tactics and techniques that I used up north down here. And I'm like, well, they work up there. Fishing is fishing, right? Wrong. Okay. Fl South Florida is such a unique area. So unique. And we, right here collectively, are in one of the most challenging areas to fish anywhere in the Southeast United States. Probably anywhere in the United States. Why? Because first of all, the pressure. You ever go out Hillsborough Inlet on a Saturday morning? For the love of God, I mean, seriously. If you're not out by nine o'clock, don't go, okay? I mean, don't go. And forget it if Jamie's having one of his tournaments, okay, or somebody, because now you've got 180 boats fishing up and down the edge, everywhere from here to Jupiter, and all the way down to Miami. The pressure is ridiculous. There's so many boats. And it's not that everybody knows how to fish because they don't. Trust me, they don't. A very small percentage do. But what they do know how to do is run their boats all over the place, zigzagging here or there. They fish by the radio. Hey, what'd you catch? Two dolphin at 600. Great, I'm coming. Dude, why are you going there? You can't catch fish that were already caught, right? They were already caught. You can't go there, okay? You can't catch them. But there's so much pressure. So we're dealing in such a challenging environment. And these fish are not stupid. These fish are smart. They're smart because there is abundant, an abundance of live bait. Okay, the water is so clear, usually, especially when you go offshore. They're not dumb, you know. They, they know when something's off. But, you know, it doesn't mean we still can't have great experiences because we can. When we get all dialed in and when the pieces to the puzzle come together, we go out and we have a great experience. And I like to say, you know, fishing is not about what you catch. Fishing is about the experience with family, with friends. It's about preparation. You get that tingly feeling. When I go and I, I, I'm getting ready, I'm spooling reels, I'm rigging baits, I got that funny feeling in my stomach, I'm fired up. I don't care what I catch. That's part of it, right? Okay, all the way to, you know, on the flip side, all the way to coming back and filleting that fish and cooking it and eating it. And everything in between is part of the whole experience. And sometimes it all comes together great flawlessly and you feel like a hero and sometimes you feel like a ditz you know because you had one shot at a fish and you blew it because your drag was off or something and it happens to all of us it's part of the game and every single day is different and we learn every single time we go out we learn something new because we pay attention and every single time we try and fine-tune our tactics and we go well what if I do this just a little bit different and what if I do that? And we keep trying and trying. And you know, that's what fishing is about. And when we do catch a quality fish or a boatload of quality fish, it makes it all worthwhile. And it just makes us want to go back even more. Okay? So I'm going to end this again real quick. I appreciate everybody coming. I hope that you picked up a couple of tips, you know, that you can use when you go out there. Stick with it. Don't ever forget about the fundamentals because without the fundamentals, you're not catching anything. Okay? And that's where it all starts. And don't be afraid, you know, if you don't know how to rig that ballyhoo, buy rigged ballyhoo. Because the worst thing that can happen is you go out, you spend all this time, energy, effort, you hook a nice fish, and you lose them, you reel it up because you realized your crimp came apart. You know, something simple cost you that fish. So don't be afraid to, you know, to start right